So Jennifer Holt is the acting CEO of Building Markets, an award-winning nonprofit that finds, builds, and connects small and medium enterprises in developing countries to buyers and investors. Previously, Jennifer was an independent consultant leading on a range of initiatives that promoted poverty reduction and advanced humanitarian and, uh, and development objectives in countries like Syria and El Salvador. Prior to this, she was the de deputy executive director of Building Markets. Under her management, Building Markets facilitated over $1 billion in contracts to local entrepreneurs in Afghanistan, Haiti, Liberia, and Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste? Timor-Leste. Okay, Leste. Um, and created more than 65,000 full-time jobs. Uh, she's also worked at the uh, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, she's skilled in organ, and I'm going to mention this because, um, so when we do Q&A, we, we open it up for questions, you'll know some of Jennifer's specific skills, but organizational strategy, program and service design, project management, communications, and development. Um, she has a master from Columbia. And she's spoken on the subjects of aid effectiveness and private sector development at Oxford, the Council on Foreign Relations, the UN, the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and NATO. So it's really an honor to have you here. <laughs> so we'll have a seat up here. Um, oh, and let me play the video, actually. Hold it, hold it one second. Let's, let's hit, the, hit the lights and do the video for, the, for anyone who hasn't seen it, and just to refresh our... When a large-scale conflict or disaster happens in the world, governments and other donors come together and commit extraordinary resources to address the crisis in the afflicted country. The UN, NGOs, donors, and other international companies set up operations and begin delivering critical services and rebuilding infrastructure. This all sounds good, right? But how much aid money is actually spent in the countries it's meant to help? The answer is not much as little as 5% of budgets reach these local economies. Most goods and services needed to carry out and sustain operations are imported from other countries. Why is this a problem? For countries to be independent of international assistance, not only do they need new clinics and roads, they need a functioning economy that can create jobs and supply the goods and services its citizens demand. And while billions of dollars are spent on aid and peacekeeping each year, most profits and proceeds are sent back to the developed world, leaving little sustainable investment behind. This creates a cycle of dependence on foreign resources where people remain unemployed, economic growth is slowed, and instability can return. What's the solution? Instead of shipping goods and services in from other countries to carry out projects, the international community could start buying local. This would allow critical services to be provided while creating much needed livelihoods and developing local capacity. Why isn't this happening already? There are some key obstacles to local procurement, including an absence of information, corruption, and convoluted contracting processes, all of which inhibit local sourcing. The good news is an organization called Building Markets has been set up to address this very problem. Through an innovative approach, Building Markets provides a set of services that help facilitate connections between the international community and local companies so that domestic firms are used wherever possible to carry out business. This includes training firms on how to find and bid on contracts, setting up and maintaining a supplier directory where verified local companies can be easily located, market research and advocacy, tender distribution services, matchmaking promising local firms with development demands. By spending locally, businesses are encouraged to grow and industries evolve National governments can invest new tax revenue to improve infrastructure, and corruption is reduced as businesses enter the formal economy. Sound too good to be true? It's not. Building Markets has helped redirect over $1.1 billion into the economies of Afghanistan, Haiti, Liberia, and Timor-Leste, creating thousands of opportunities and jobs where they are needed most. Building Markets is a nonprofit social enterprise that contributes to peace and stability in conflict-prone countries by championing local entrepreneurs and connecting them to new business opportunities. Ah, well, uh, that's a great video. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, I, that's, it's actually a bit outdated. So that was, uh, we welcome you to this Beyond the Headlines event 
Hold on. Resources and what it means. Sorry about that. I just don't have it down yet. So that video was actually done a few years ago. We just trying to communicate what the organization was doing at the time. And I worked in the animator to do that. Uh, so now we're offering a few other uh, additional markets, Myanmar and Mozambique. Um, we no longer have operations in Afghanistan, in KT and Timor-Leste, although we maintain a network of businesses there. We have about 20,000 businesses in our network overall. And we also, our, our services have changed just a little bit, just to give you sort of a, a quick snapshot overview. And essentially what we do is we go into a market, we find businesses. One of the biggest barriers to doing business in these markets is there's very low visibility. And so we go and find the businesses, we profile them, we make sure they meet certain standards and expectations. And then that helps inform everything else we do. Then we build those businesses once they're in our network through training and technical assistance, and we help them access the working capital they need to grow and become competitive. And then we connect them through a set of services, um, which were, they're pretty similar, but it's everything from tender distribution services, and we actually look for the opportunities that exist in these markets that are not often, again, easy to find, make sure they're in the local language, and we distribute them through SMS platforms, email, and tender distribution points in our offices, and then we have investor showcases and other events that network and match make the suppliers to buyers and investors. Um, and that's really, really a, a really simple approach that's actually created all of those um, contracts and create all that employment. So, just a quick update. Mm -hmm. um, and how long has Billing Markets been around? Uh, it was started up in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, what happened, our founder, uh, Scott Gilmore, he was working at Timor Leste at the time as a foreign diplomat and was observing a, a problem that was happening that, again, was touched on in this video, which was that all this money was coming into these economies, but it wasn't really harnessing or capturing uh, the local economic potential there, creating jobs and bypassing them all together. Most of the money that was being used by big development agencies and organizations that were on the ground to run their programs and operations was being all sourced elsewhere. And that just didn't make any sense. It seemed really counterproductive when the overall goal really is to create conditions where we're no longer needed, right? <laughs> yet we're actually just creating conditions where we're actually needed forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so <clears throat> there was a big question mark, though, which was, actually, how much money is being spent locally? Do we even know the answer to that question? And is it having a positive effect, or is it having a negative effect? Are there distortions happening because of this big influx of resources that are coming into these markets? And no one really knew the answer, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. so you Decades of big, large pink kidney missions. Wait, and so this is, give me some, so this is like 2004. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, so I'm this, is, this is 2003 <laughs> probably, actually. 2002, okay. I mean, with just the conception of the idea was happening in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. but it was even a little bit before that. So, <clears throat> um, but the actual sort of, when the, the organization was launched, it was more like 2004. Mm -hmm. And that was to answer this big question, which no one really knew how to answer, which was what's happening with all this money, and is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, and so I was actually working in the UN at that time with the Peace Kingdom Department, which is how uh, I got introduced to building markets in the sky. And um, we undertook a big analysis looking at, I won't go into, but it essentially looked at nine peacekeeping missions to see what was actually happening with these budgets and where money was being spent. And how on earth? I mean, I'm imagining that there are groups and forces that would want to prevent that knowledge from yeah. <laughs> coming to from surfacing a little bit, or at that time, there might have been. You know, I think, I mean, absolutely, and I think probably there was uh, some nervousness about it, mm -hmm. but also I think really overall, actually people just didn't really have the, organi the, the information even organized in such a way that it was easy yeah. to be able to answer the question. Right? It took a lot of legwork and digging around to even see where money was being was going, mm -hmm. you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, are, there, were, uh, there were a lot of proponents of it, too. People realized this was a really important question to answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the peace of side in particular, they knew that you know, the economic potential and, and ensuring that that was uh, 
uh, being harnessed was incredibly important to the longer term objective. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> there was some pushback back in, in some places, I think more than others. Mm -hmm. But but overall, what was found was actually quite positive anyway. Even though there was not a lot of money being spent, it was still having an incredible impact on GDP. Mm -hmm. You know, so even in the tiniest places like Liberia, we're still seeing um, a really positive trend. So the immediate sort of answer was, well, wait a minute, you know, we can actually increase this more and think about what could potentially happen and how it could contribute overall again to that peacekeeping effort. And so it was not meant to be a criticism of peacekeeping. You know, it was presented that way. It was really like, how can we help you do better here? Um, and uh, and so in many ways, they were very on board with that. Like, I think they realized it's, it's time for a sea change. Yeah. Uh, so, and then that was applied just more broadly. We initially started helping the UN, but then obviously there's all kinds of quote unquote buyers in these markets, whether it's uh, the UN or other big international <coughs> agencies and companies and uh, NGOs who are all carrying out programs and trying to sustain their operations. So, helping them connect locally rather than having them sort of do the easiest thing, thing which may be you know, pulling in all their capacity <coughs> elsewhere and sourcing all their services from elsewhere, which Maybe a good short-term solution. You might be able to get things done tomorrow, but really, what is the, the longer-term benefit of that? Not much. So, any questions? Okay. So, can we just do a quick like, um, and maybe this is for my benefit mainly, sure. but probably would help some people in the audience too. Can you define international development? And sure. talk about if it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and maybe talk about. So I'm interested in how how it's how it's changed. Like yeah. what, what it means and you know maybe what it meant when you start you know in 2004-ish and yeah. what it means now. Yeah, well I think it's important to, yeah, it, it, that's a really excellent question. I think it's important to kind of parse it out a little bit because yeah. we have the humanitarian side, I would say, of development assistance and then the development side, mm -hmm. which looks more at, you know, recovery and rehabilitation and longer term mm -hmm. reconstruction and and the humanitarian side is the early stage stuff that's all focused on saving lives. First obviously. responders. First responders, but they can go on for quite a while. I mean, I think, you know, as you know, from many crises around the world. But so that's that's one piece of it. And actually, I would say in many in many ways, it works a lot more efficiently than the rest. Mm -hmm. um, they've gotten much better at responding to crises. You know, there's a process that they go through. And who's they? Like, give an example, like Red International Red Rescue Committee, Mercy Corps. Yeah. Uh, all those big players, um, you know, in the UN, it's the it's it's OCHA, which is the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. They're sort of the first people on the ground, mm -hmm. often in a crisis, because they're coordinating the effort. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, it's all the big international, non-governmental organizations, humanitarian organizations in the space that also then arrive to start delivering services. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, yeah, the development side, which is really then all that money that's contributed by bilateral governments um, and multilateral agencies that's really investing again then in recovery and rehabilitation and reconstruction and that's a much longer process um, so you can see that that's been happening in places like uh, parts of africa where the crisis ended well over a decade ago and we're still focused on development um, so does that help definitely does that help yeah Great. So in Syria right now, we're obviously focused on, you know, we're five years in, but we're still solely focused on the humanitarian side of it. Mm -hmm. But trying to have an eye towards development now as well. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just creating this war economy and, you know, looking at how to think about that more term lens mm -hmm. in the humanitarian stage. And how has, it, how has it changed since you've been working in this space? I mean, what are some of the things... Um, I hesitate to use the word trends, but I am I'm always interested in and how things are shifting and yeah. what's emerging. And I think there have been a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. A lot of changes. Positive ones. Um, you know, what we have observed over particularly the last couple of decades is that we have not made a lot of progress in any way, but yet we've been a lot of progress, <laughs> right? And so that's a very interesting... Well, that's a oh, great. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. So is it because of us or something else? Right, right. Yeah, right? That's the question everyone's asking right now, which <laughs> yeah. I think is a great question, because yeah. it's it's the interconnectivity. 
growth of these countries and sustainability mm -hmm. and the independence of them, that a lot more people have gotten involved in the space. Uh, also, I'm sure you know, there's a massive impact investing space that has boomed over the last couple of years. Uh, and investors also, traditional investors are also interested in these markets. Um, and that's because, you know, they're seeing returns in the markets they generally invest in decline, the emerging markets even, um, are declining. And so they see these last frontiers as a real opportunity, which is fantastic. But anyway, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's too much. I'm just going to jump in every once in a while. So, so now emerging markets are not, they're already oversaturated or? Well, they're not necessarily oversaturated, but there's, the returns are starting to decline. They're not the place that they were before. Yeah. And it's so, amazing. But you have these frontiers, yeah, right? Yeah. And are developing or post crisis yeah. markets and we're all kinds of lingo and language around them. The investors would refer to those frontier markets. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you meet the, the growth that's anticipated in these markets over the next couple of decades is remarkable, right? I mean, by 2050, Nigeria's population will surpass ours, you know? And you have you know, 200 million youth in Africa, and that's going to double I think, by 2040 or something, you know? So, you know, and consumer demand is going to go off the charts, and you know, so the idea of being able, to, the idea of investment opportunities is huge, mm -hmm. and there's already investors that are that are operating in many of these markets and doing very very well, mm -hmm. but um, many of them don't quite have the conditions yet that are ready for investment, and so that, that's a, that's where I see um, a really critical role for the international development community to play. Um, and they're starting again to shift towards that as well because they see that's a role that they can play. They see the potential for investment in these markets and how that can accelerate the climate of poverty. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a lot of what the impact investing space is doing, right? Um, they're starting to uh, you know, have this you know, traditional investment approach, but they also see you know, a financial return while doing social good, you know, having a social benefit at the same time. So, so can you talk a little bit about um, some of the dynamics? And you could use a case, you know, you could actually talk about a, a particular place if that would make it easier. But I'm interested in, because um, the idea from, you know, 30,000 feet sure. sounds amazing and perfect, but I can only imagine the complex cities on the ground. <laughs> so maybe can you walk us through, like, it could be a small, an incident, or a small project, or, or a place, a big, you know, a, a bigger scenario. Like what, um, what sort of happens? Um, what are some of the? What are you looking for when you're looking for your suppliers on the ground? What are, what are the dynamics? What does your, what does it look like to be in the middle of this kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think it does probably seem a lot more complex than. It is. I mean, the kinds of networks and technologies that we have don't exist there in some ways, although everybody has a mobile phone, you know? So there's that, you know, everybody is connected in some ways, but a lot of the other ways that the infrastructure that we have that allows us to, to so easily communicate and get around and all that doesn't necessarily exist. But a lot of these places are also small, and where the development is happening is very concentrated. Um, you know, a lot of, I think, the reason that more progress hasn't been made Right? And so it's literally running around and connecting dots. It's literally running around and sitting down and having conversations. You know, um, and, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't, the, our industry doesn't allow for time, right? We want to, we've got, you know, again, we've got to meet deadlines and we've got to meet the targets that have been set out in our proposals, you know, by X date. And that's not realistic based on how these, set up in the infrastructure that they lack. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's, not, it's, I, it's not as difficult as you would think it is. You know, I mean, I think you really do have to rely on, again, local sources. You know, one of the, the big mistakes that also the international community makes is they 
assume there's all these, these problems? Not, not the same users that they want to but yeah. they assume there's all these problems and they kind of have these, all these ideas about what the solutions are. They haven't really locally engaged to figure out, actually, are those the right problems? And then what would the right solutions be? You know, there's so much local talent and you know, information that exists in, the, in these countries that's not really engaged upon. And when you start to do that, a lot of the answers seem much more clear. Mm -hmm. The solutions seem much more clear. Um, but it's legwork, it's time. Mm -hmm. I mean, because things, you know, you've got all these different players in these markets, you know, I mean, and, and some of the more difficult ones, you've got a whole range of development agencies that are dispersing aid, and you've got the local government, which is not necessarily not ever, you know, has the capacity that it needs in order to be able to perform its job. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a whole range of, you know, development contractors and organizations who are also, and everybody's kind of bumping into each other and there's a million <laughs> meetings going on. And, I mean, that's really the complexity part of it. I think there's a lot of time wasted in trying, in trying to get things done because we uh, have created all of these, we, I think we actually, the international a lot of processes that have slowed things down, to be honest, you know, working groups and clusters that meet, you know, and to discuss what the problems are, yeah. as opposed to just getting out there and doing the work and actually engaging more locally. Um, and so I can't think of like an exact example. Most of the examples that I think of are with the revelations that I've had when I thought, oh, if I know this industry is, is not getting it right, you know. Um, Can you one? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when I was, so I've been in the uh, development industry for a number of years, but I went out to, um, I went out to Afghanistan for four months, four or five months to, when was this? This was in 2005, 2006, 2006. Wow. And my job was to undertake an analysis that would set a baseline for how the international community is spending its money. Back to what we were talking about before in this, you know, how much of their money was actually being spent on local goods and services versus how much was being spent, um, you know, being sourced outside of the country. And that was because the international community had signed on to this big compact and <clears throat> And one of their commitments in the contact was to increase the amount of money that they were spending locally, but they had set no baseline which to measure progress on that. Mm -hmm. So the British, go figure, right? Like, let's have, I'll make a bunch of commitments and we yes. have no baseline which to be able to know if we're doing good. And we're supposed to achieve them all, by the way, in five years. <laughs> um, so these, again, are like the kinds of complexity. We're like, ah! Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so the Brits, who are, um, are really, I would say the Brits being um, DFID, uh, the VA arm of the British government, have always been quite innovative. They said, well, let's get in there and let's set a baseline. Let's figure out what's happening. And so I sat with the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. and the Afghan government. Um, and because they had a whole lot of data about how money was being spent, we basically looked at you know, one year. Um, and as part of that process, I then ran around and talked to everybody under the sun. I talked to all the development agencies, development agencies to see how they were spending their money. The large contractors. I talked to the NGOs, um, and that's where I, I got pushed back. By the way, you know, when people are not showing you where we're spending our money, like how's that gonna reflect on us? Yeah, yeah. A lot of diplomacy in that process. Yeah. Um, but then I sat down with the Afghan businesses. So I spent the last part of my time there, I just spent running around, sitting down, and interviewing Afghan businesses all over Kabul. Furniture making businesses, you know, construction businesses. Um, you know, I have to. This is difficult. Was, was it difficult? And were you by yourself as a I woman? A, I, at that time, the security situation deteriorated later on. At that time, I had no security. I was in a soft cover car, i.e. like a Toyota. Um, <laughs> I had a driver, and it, I had a translator with me, and one that's it. And those are the Afghan businesses that I met with spoke English. And so when I got to them, what really what I was looking at was, OK, what are the challenges that you're facing, and where are you getting your goods and services? We can figure out 
unconscionable content. There's actually any contracts that were being left locally. Um, and just to understand what your experience was. And so, and I don't know what my expectations were. I'm sure I was nervous, you know, to go run around, as you say, as a woman from, at that time, there weren't a lot of women running around. They were sitting in compounds. You did get a lot of attention. People were just very curious. Um, not for, I was threatened. Uh, but it's warmly welcomed into these businesses. You were all, they were all at that time run by men. I don't think I met a single female in business at that time. Uh, who sat down and, you know, sat down with me and shared their proposals and the bids that they had lost and their confusion over the process and their clarity, though, over how there's no way to compete with these large development contractors and win contracts, but yet they didn't know how to overcome that obstacle and they understood it that they didn't meet the standards and expectations, but what were they going to do? And that was sort of an aha moment for me when I realized, wait, we got this wrong. Again, our yeah. purpose here is to create conditions where we no longer are needed. The private sector is so critical. Here were these very viable businesses um, who, through their own resourceful, resourcefulness and drive, were continuing to operate, um, not keeping the employment levels that they but there was this massive influx of aid coming in and not, not engaging with them, just completely bypassing them. And that's when I knew that that was wrong. <laughs> you know, we're not doing this right. Yeah. 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 Sounds like it. Um, do you guys want to start asking some questions? questions? So, obviously, setting up, you know, like doing the legwork of finding businesses and talking to people in relationships takes work yes but yet sort of the the countries in the video are dated so can you maybe talk about like there's like not as much aid going to Afghanistan for example anymore and like you also are not there anymore so can you kind of talk about just as an organization how you strategize what countries to work in how you choose to like pull out of markets and those yeah. decisions yeah that's a good question um and you hit on another really a big point on but, I mean, essentially, you know, a lot of, and this is, again, a problem with our, our industry and being a nonprofit, uh, and I'm a, I'm a big cynic about, about nonprofits, too, so feel free to ask questions about that. I think that the way we operate, actually, is really flawed as well. Um, just, you know, at, at large. But a lot of it's donor-driven. They say, you know, we've got budgets to... Uh, can you operate in Liberia because there is a need for, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so you, know, you apply for proposals and you get programs that way. And we're obviously also always seeking out um, countries where we think there's a very good fit for us based on the kind of services that we offer um, and, and, and doing development that way. And that's based on a fairly broad country analysis and the kinds of indicators that we think need to exist in a country in order for us to be successful. Um, and so that could be, you know, well, that's a whole range of things. Um, everything from governance and regulatory environments, you know, uh, to, to other issues around business development, ease of doing business. So how many are we going to be able to capture by working in, 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 a, in a country like this? Um, well, can I just ask out of curiosity, is that like an algorithm or a spreadsheet or is that more like Let's so we have a snapshot, yeah, like a yeah. whiteboard. Is it a little? Is it formal or informal? Is yeah, it's a bit. We did um, a couple of years ago. We did a really huge analysis across about 180, 180 countries, okay. essentially, um, um, and narrowing it down to you know like 10 or 15, truly. You know mm -hmm. where we felt like there were indicators that aligned with us, but still, you know, we've kind of gotten off course of that a little bit because uh, you know a, a Liberia may not be. A, I'm so glad that the organization is there because incredible things have happened. Mm -hmm. There's a big focus on it. There's a lot of aid spending happening there. And there's just a remarkable team there. And they're just doing the extraordinary things. And the entrepreneurial spirit, spirit there is fantastic. There's a huge need for the work the organization is doing. There's other people in our space as well um, that are doing similar things. And so it's all worked out. You know. um, but just to go back to what you were talking about, I don't know if I answered your question, but um, at the beginning, and it, it, it goes back to what you were saying in terms of complexity, one of the big issues in these environments, and you, I kind of forget and take, 
take a minute sometimes. It's, you obviously can't just go into a market like this and expect businesses to start engaging with you, right? Mm -hmm. There's huge trust and confidence issues that you've got to be able to win over mm -hmm. in order to be able to um, cultivate those relationships and where they feel like they're actually going to get a return from you, which is really important. Yeah. You know, whereas we might just expect you to go in and say, you know, Hey, we're gonna do this for you. You know, can you give us all of your information? That's really the way it works. It really takes <laughs> six months, yeah. of course, of literally running around and doing door knocking. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and talking to businesses and telling them, you know, what it is that you know we're trying to accomplish and you know, before we can even sometimes sit down and have that first face to face mm -hmm. one hour interview mm -hmm. where we ask them sixty questions, you know. <laughs> um, you know, so that trust confidence issue, just like in any market, it takes some time to build. So who does that from, I mean, do you go do that, or do you, is there, are there a certain set of skills that are good to have? Is it different from country to country? I imagine it is. We like, rely you? on all of the staff to do that. So that okay. first piece of it, so that the first thing that the organization does when it goes into the market is this broad-based verification. Well, right before that, there's a piece of market research that's generally done to say, so what's the demand? supply in this market, what's happening here. Um, and then after that, that that analysis is undertaken, the idea is to source procurement lists wherever possible and business registry lists so we can kind of compile like right away just to get us as many businesses as we can. And then we hire our local teams to really start to go and set up interviews. You know, and you start talking to businesses, here's what we're here doing, you know, we'd like to talk to you, and this is why, and this is, this is the, these are the services we'd like to provide you, do you need them? Um, if you'd like to be part of our network, we would like to sit down with you and have, a, you know, an hour interview, and we're going to ask you a whole range of questions. Um, you only have to meet certain qualifications uh, in order to be part of the network, but the whole other range of questions, you know, um, we, we ask anyway. Um, so when you were talking about kind of the behemoth nature of this uh, industry and how there's these checklists and logic models and all these things that are being used, what, how long does that take? Like, are you seeing a shift in how that operates? Are, are these still little pockets of innovation or do you think it's possible to actually shift the machinery of, you know, international development? I would like to think so. Um, you know, aid budgets are shrinking, shrinking. They're getting smaller, and I think that's forcing. Uh, I think that's forcing a lot of governments. When we're talking about those kinds of donors, to rethink the way that they, you know, they're, they manage aid and the kinds of programs and projects that they support. Some of them are act, act, actually integrating with, you know, their trade. So the Canadians have done that, the Australians have just done that, they're two big donors, right? So they're looking more at, you know, development finance and, you know, focusing on the investment side. Um, and so that requires a larger risk appetite. But um, how quickly they will move beyond some of those processes, I don't know. They're so entrenched in a lot of that bureaucracy, it's really difficult to think about how to change it. Um, foundations, in many cases, are a lot more flexible, obviously, um, and are not beholden to those same, that same kind of rigidity as every government is. Uh, and so I, there's a lot more innovation that seems to happen outside of that space. Like, um, like the Gates Foundation? Like the Gates Foundation, yeah. the Skull Foundation, mm -hmm. the Rockefeller Foundation, um, yeah, Ford, others. Uh, Skull in particular mm -hmm. is one that's really a huge innovator in the space. Um, they, every year, choose 10 organizations. They give them a large sum of money. <coughs> they're very flexible. It actually encourages them to innovate. They choose organizations that they see that are at scale, have large potential, and they really like, invest in you, which is fantastic. So there are, there are other you know, uh, things that are happening on the government side, and it's tough. It's a, it's a, it's a really, um, because you know, they're also, it's tax dollars, right? You know, there's, there's reasons it happens. I think the incentives are just all wrong, you know? And until we change the incentives, um, the way in which 
which we are accountable is going to continue to be kind of backwards. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> we are accountable to our beneficiaries, right? They're not paying us. So we really know that to create problems, right? We're accountable to our donors. Um, and so we're accountable to uh, the, you know, logic frameworks and all that stuff, right? <laughs> we're accountable to the processes, not necessarily the outcomes. Uh, and so these things are, you know, getting that right is the same thing at the top. Um, going off. Yeah, is that okay? Just going off Sorry, of what you just said. Can I just control the temperature? Kara. Yeah, yeah, I think it's cooler. Yeah. Thank you. Only if you have something that you'll say. It's one or the other. Yeah. Thank you, Kara. Okay. Um, I'm interested, after you say that all of these have been in the place, why you're on, still a nonprofit instead of a day social enterprise, yada, 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 be cool, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yes. That's a really good question. That's <laughs> one that I, so, so I actually am still grappling with that. I, I, I left building markets in 2012, early 2012. I just recently came back. I remained senior advisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been in, I've been continued to be involved in the organization since I left in 2012, where I was co running it with um, the outgoing CEO for six years. And one of the reasons that I left at that time is because I really was, uh, I felt, you know, I had just become not, not just a cynic, but I just really knew that what we were doing wasn't working. Not we as an organization, but overall. Um, and, uh, and so right now, the way I look at it through the lens of being a nonprofit is how do we shift what we're doing where we can actually start creating value, monetizing our services, so that we're generating that revenue to the work that we're doing, I think actually we should be, and we're not enough. And I don't know if that's because we're not generating the re enough value in order to be able to monetize them, and monetizing them can be charging. We already do are doing it in some cases. In Liberia, we have, where there's just a massive demand for our training, we charge for our training, and people pay for it. It's excellent. It's a really great program. We've got an incredible library facilitator there. Um, and we're starting to play and test with it in other markets, so it is happening. Um, you know, just converting over to a, a, a you know, is, is a, I think, a, a little bit more difficult. I mean, if I had this to do all over again, if I started something new, I would start a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I would start a for profit business for sure. Um, based on the work that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And um, because we're trying to fill a market gap, right? Mm -hmm. And so theoretically, if that's what you're doing, you should be creating enough value where you can charge something for it because the market should take it over. Mm -hmm. um, so we're playing around with it. and. and Done before you're seeing solely transition between this part. Saying what? Sorry. So basically, like um, Bill Forsell saying was not necessarily done in a certain way that you would like to see, and development um, process was you know like done in a traditional way, like bureaucracy and a lot of like you know processes. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned um, previously that it's transition. Yeah. Like you're starting to see different ways of doing it. Well, for example, saying it's like more prominent. Where have they like, can you more explain on how that transition is being made and what's causing them? Um, I think it's really I, you know, and it's not just in it's not just in in, in a, a space like ours where we yeah. focus solely on SME development, right? It's in the water and sanitation sector. You know, it's in other it's in the health sector where people are starting to think, you know, if I dig a well. Who's going to manage the well, right? I mean, how do we make that sustainable? How do we engage the community around that? Water.org is doing great things on that. Um, so I think a lot of people have just realized that going and setting up these projects, right, without really engaging locally, um, it doesn't work. It, 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 you know, you just, it fails altogether. It's not sustainable. And so figuring out how to build that in such a way where there is the right kind of community buy-in, community involvement, community leadership, um, around it 
um, has a, you know, a much greater success altogether. So I think people have experienced that across a whole range of sectors, and so that's why we're seeing a change as well. Um, A lot of professional development organizations are considering shifting from delivering goods to doing cash transfers yeah. to families in place. Yeah. And there's a lot of controversies and debate over that. Yeah. I'd like to know what you think about Yeah. Shift. Well, so I think that I think that cash transfers can be good, right? Because you are putting hands right with you're putting money right in the hands of the beneficiary and you're empowering them to go and buy the, the goods that they need, that they feel that they need, and that makes sense to me. Um, and uh, you know, there's some really interesting organizations that are doing very uh, deep analytical research on this. Give Directly is one of them that's run. I don't know if you've heard of Give Directly, but it's an economist that are doing that with longitudinal research on, on these direct cash payouts, which I think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in places like Syria right now, there's a huge focus on cash payouts as opposed to delivering. You know, food baskets and um, and other things like you know, giving them uh, giving them cash to go in and then go into a market and buy a certain you know set of services. But so that's good in one way, but it's very short sighted, right? Because it doesn't really tackle the bigger problem. So we're giving cash, but then what? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the big question. But then what? Mm -hmm. So great, you've got money and you can go and spend on these things. But then where's your revenue coming from? Um, where's your do you have a job? Probably not. You know, how can we engage these people in employment mm -hmm. where it's possible? And uh, and so the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, who has done a lot of stuff on, is doing a lot of work on cash payouts. Is also complementing that with a lot of livelihood programs. So in the Syria context, for instance, where there's a big, you probably know, there's 22 million people in Syria. Half the population is displaced right now, either internally or across the borders in places like Lebanon and Jordan. Jordan. So they're setting up livelihood programs at the same time too. So I think cash payouts can be good, but I don't think they're a solution. You know, I think they're palliative, essentially. Um, yeah. I have a question. What what one is there something you run up against regularly that would make whether it's techn a technological obstacle or I mean what what obstacles exist that if they weren't in place we could be programs could be much more successful, more fluid, more reaching more people, creating more jobs. There's tons of information and perfections. What does know? that mean? Um, so information asymmetries, you know, there's just there's you know visibility in these markets. People don't know, you know, taking our example, buyers don't know what suppliers yeah. exist, suppliers don't know what buyers <coughs> exist. Uh, development agencies who are looking to start programs in these countries have no idea what talent or expertise exists on the ground so that they could connect with them to find out what's actually happening in the space that they're interested in. So they fly a consultant in to find out instead. Great See, this is like, this sounds like a good design challenge. Yeah. There's so <laughs> many Doesn't have it no feel idea. like <laughs> this is something we could take care of? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it does. I mean, it really, it's a communication. Issue. There's a massive, I mean, it, I, so I'm getting ready to launch a program in Syria, and you just, you can't, you, you can't imagine some of the sort of most basic um, infrastructure that's missing. So you have the international community mm -hmm. that's operating there, and Syria is a very unique country. It's tons of capacity, right? It's not like a, an isolated country in West Africa, right? They previously a developed country that's now gone through this incredible upheaval. <clears throat> And so you've had all of these Syrian organizations, hundreds of them, that have emerged but are not able to access donor funding or uh, partnerships with unwilling partners. And many times they don't know why. Um, there are um, no platforms in which they can you know, communicate with each other even to know what their, their individual priorities are. The international community doesn't know what the priorities of the Syrian community is. The Syrian community doesn't understand the priorities of the international community. <laughs> There's nothing even centralized around that. So then that's just like a very simple example. Like you can, it's so hard to imagine that you would someone would have just thrown up a website already to say, like, you know, you know, here are all like here's all this really basic information that help guide you um, through this. I mean, if you're in the kind of training events that are happening over the next month, then 
meetings that might be relevant and priorities and counterpoint. Nothing. You know, it doesn't even exist. But there are a lot of tensions as a result because there's all this miscommunication and misunderstanding between the two sides. It just can be easily, easily alleviated with something as simple as that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of information imperfections and just a lot of just low visibility on what exists and what's happening, and so things get bypassed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, have you seen any innovative ways that um, the international development community has been building knowledge capacity um, in these countries as far as like not relying on, for example, the World Bank to do your research and tell you what the problem is? Guys. <laughs> There's a wonderful you know, um, uh, social enterprise, it's for profit, called On Frontiers. And this is what they're doing. This is run by this really dynamic, wonderful Danish woman that I know I used to work with actually, Ann Courier, who saw that who observed this problem. So she she been she actually came from the private sector uh, originally, but worked out in, in Liberia and the Liberian government and um, But saw that local expertise and talent was not being accessed. Um, uh, what's that company? Um, the developed world, basically. I'm going to give you an example that you might know right away. What they do? Um, essentially, they had experts that said mainly in developed markets all over the world, and so. Anybody, they, they use their services, anybody can call them if they need specific subject matter expertise, they'll set up an interview with them so that they can give them an overview of that particular, you know. I know this is going to Ah! <laughs> um, they'll, they'll, you know, so they can give them a quick overview uh, of what's happening in that particular area of the market. But it doesn't exist in the, in the, in the developing world. So it was that thing I was talking about before where, um, you know, National nonprofits like building markets or uh, you know international agencies when they're setting up their aid program, their strategy, and all that, they don't know what's happening or who to talk to on the ground, and uh, and so there's often a huge and tremendous amount of waste about how to get that information. And so what she's doing is setting up a network of local experts mm -hmm. across all of these countries, um, and it's going. I mean, she is just. It's, on fire. I mean, she, you know, she's just she's been operating for a year. She's already in like 16 countries. She's already got 400 experts, um, <laughs> and you know everybody from I think you know the Wall Street Journal to some of the big development agencies to investors have already been using her. Mm -hmm. It just shows what a huge demand, and that capital is only going to grow. Yeah. But it's it's another just example of innovation and, and, and perfection. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so she's doing it. She's really tackling that. And it's based in Denmark or based here? Here, she's based here in New York City. And how does that organization address to this beyond the corruption? How did what? Are you able to get beyond the corruption? Yeah, um, you know, you can't get, you can't always get beyond it, right? Um, there is no corruption in corporate America. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. exactly. The, the corruption is on both sides, too, yeah. right? So what you see in a lot of these markets, you know, Afghanistan is a perfect example because there's just an unprecedented amount of money going in there. Right? <laughs> that is and a recipe for trouble. A recipe for trouble. <laughs> and oh, very little regulation of any of it, right? And so it's very easy to skim off contracts and extort and do all of that. And that's happening on both sides. Um, but you know there are some ways in order it, it, to, to manage the risk by ensuring that basic, for example, in our model, I mean, what we would do is make sure that that basic standards are in place, they're properly registered and licensed, and we actually do the legwork of going out and sitting with a business. Does the business that you say you have actually exist? You know, so going out to see that it is there, because people will also, of course, set the business that's not necessarily that business. It seems like um, a very simple and probably really. Work. Yeah. You know, it's just like doing yeah. not like work. Instead of just assuming they're all corrupt, mm -hmm. right? It's like going out there and, and just doing the work. And, and that's worked very well for us. 
Um, but I think you know once we as a once the international community makes a decision to operate in some of these places, you also have to be willing to take on a certain amount of risk. You can't, and that that's one been one of our biggest mistakes. I think one of our biggest failures is that we decide we're going to operate in a country where we know there's huge corruption because we know that there's not a regulatory environment in place, a legal system in place that necessarily protects you. Um, there's not insurance and all of that. Um, and so then we have all this money to spend, and we say, oh, we can't do any of those things because it's too risky. Like, what are we doing here? You know? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's, you can't get around all the corruption, but there's certainly things that you can uh, do. And the more you're putting the right incentives in place on the ground, the more people are likely also to leave the informal economy informal because they're incentivized to do so. Some of the methods you guys use to ensure businesses continue to be prosperous once you leave a country? Sure. Um, well, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's a, and we, we don't necessarily track businesses after we're gone. Um, we do a lot of work to track progress while we're there. There's a lot of metrics that we use constantly. We just are sitting on so much data. We're actually, that's our biggest challenge right now is we have, you know, 20,000 businesses and 60 to 100 data points on those businesses and the terrible data management system. <laughs> um, uh, so we, we collect, you know, a whole range of metrics. And so once we go in and do that initial profile and, profile and screen of a business where we sit down and we interview with them, we circle back to them every six months. And when we circle back to them every six months, we make sure that none of their information has changed because, again, you know, the exigencies and the validity of these environments that all the time. Uh, so we want to maintain the integrity of the data, but we also ask them questions like, you know, have you won any contracts since we last spoke to you? Have you, in, you know, have you increased the number of people that you're employing? And that will trigger a follow-up survey that happens in person. So we're looking for those kinds of changes, positive changes that, we're, that are happening and we're reporting them. I mean, in most cases, when you start to give these, it's so simple, really. I mean, in most cases, when you start to give the businesses the tools that they need, they're off and running. Right, because it really is just about access to opportunity. You know, it's not as if you know there's something else that's wrong with them. Um, it's just that a they didn't maybe know what the standard and expectations were that they needed to meet, um, and they needed the tools in which to be able to do that. Um, and and once you, you start to arm them with them, they're you know they're driven and resourceful. They go. So that brought to my about what skill sets do you see as being important like in the next five years in international development or um, um, on the, in these frontier markets? I mean, or, or for organizations like yours, I mean, data scientists. Yeah, yeah data analytics, and so we can be able to actually you know, measure progress and see what's happening in our markets. Design is obviously a huge um, deficit in the international development space, aid industry space, we're not, we don't, aid industry's not been equipped with that, they've never really been asked, you know, to, to invest in real design, you know, things like discovery work and stuff like that is not, it's the part of the lingo with the jargon, um, uh, that exists in, you know, the private sector. And so I think, um, more of a focus on design is already starting to happen, you know, uh, IEO and others are helping to transform but, but a lot of people are, are, are understanding that they need to double down and spend more money in that initial phase of work, and having that kind of talent is really important, and it doesn't necessarily exist in our industry right now. Um, I think, um, yeah, the analytics, the analytics side is obviously very, very important. You know, on the technology side, I mean, there's just all kinds of solutions waiting to be created, right? Yeah. Um, there's just been an explosion of technology, but how do we take that technology and apply it in a meaningful way where it contributes to inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. So it's not just technology of its solution that's searching for a problem, which is often what's happening. Um, but how do we really take it, you know, and, and, and apply it in a more meaningful way? And, and there's an incredible opportunity for that. You know, Who's, are there any organizations, like I know the Knight Foundation does some, what nurtures and supports? Um, 
entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who are building some of these tech solutions in the media space. I mean, are there, who's experimenting? Who are, where are there entrepreneurs or startups that are being supported or? I mean, a lot of that's happening you know, in places like Africa, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of that's happening already and being supported by you know, African entrepreneurs. I mean, a lot, some of the really interesting stuff is already happening there. But, I mean, you know, the needs are massive, right? So we've made, uh, I mean, I can't really think of, of the, off the top of my head. I mean, Skull, and Skull's another one who supports that, you know, those kinds of solutions where you, you know, look at some of, um, particularly where there's really extreme poverty and slums and how do you start, you know, bringing people and, you know, getting microfinance loans and, and that kind of thing so you can just start the very, very small businesses. Big organizations like Kiva, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of. I mean, they've got massive support for what they do. Um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of who are some of just like the, the strictly based. There's an organization called Benetech. Um, they're not necessarily focused on entrepreneurs, though, but they're technology based solutions. Mm -hmm. um, financing capital is one of the biggest inhibitors of growth in these markets. Um, and so figuring out how to more quickly get money to entrepreneurs, you know, mobile devices is the way is the way to do it. We've seen so much progress and growth around that. And so there's a lot of support for that. But I don't know exactly Rockefeller's doing it. I don't know, I don't know exactly who's doing it. There's one specifically so I have to No, that's a good sure answer. I mean I guess I was just sort of wondering if um, all the incubation yeah. of startups and ideas that are happening in the commercial space. Yeah. And just, you know, building the next great gadget yeah. to make your life more comfortable. Yeah. Kind of, like, is that, you know, is that also happening for these more practical kinds of, you know, practical, essential kinds of issues? Uh, and it sounds like it is. I mean, you gave some great it's examples. It's starting to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely starting to happen more and more. And just, but there's going to be just such a huge demand for it yeah. um, over time in these markets because there's so much progress has, has gone in as it may seem, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know, but just so much progress has been made over the last three decades where extreme poverty has basically been cut in half, right? So the number of people living on $1.25 a day has gone down, from, in developing countries has gone from 50% to 20%. That's incredible. But you know, you increase that to two dollars, and it's you know a lot higher. It's two billion. It's still got a big problem. Um, but all kinds of you know other progress has been made too. I mean, there's increasingly more educated, um, you know, people entering the workforce. There's more democracy. The health indicators are better than ever. Um, you know, there's more investors starting to look into these markets because the right reforms and regulations are in place. So that's all positive, and it's going to drive all kinds of other growth. But at the same time, you still have, you know, 800 million people who don't have access to clean water and safe sanitation. I think it's like one and a half, twice that for God, you know, say clean sanitation. You still have, you know, over a billion people who don't have access to electricity. How do you know that? These big infrastructure problems that are slowing productivity in big ways um, and slowing growth. And, and how do we address those issues? Um, I think in many ways markets are the ones that are going to, on its own. I mean, I think that's really what's responsible for a lot of the progress that we've seen as opposed to aid. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, we still have all these, you know, these other problems that are happening and the conditions that really need to be created in order to be able to really capitalize on that potential. You know, and, and that's the, that's where these creative solutions and there's a million of ways to be. It's all on you guys. <laughs> so when you're trying to foster um, sustainable development, what role does environmental sustainability play in this kind of thing? Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I think that's also something that's now increasingly being paid attention to, whereas maybe it wasn't so long ago. So it's, you know, in our case, it's ensuring that businesses are trained on environment. What does that mean? You know, how do you know that um, you are, you know, uh, 
protecting the environment the way that you should, that your practices include you know, environmental sustainability of them. Because if you want to work with a big extractive company, for example, in Liberia, those kinds of environmental standards, standards need to be part of your business model. Right, so um, it, it's it's more and more it's becoming part of part of practice, um, but I think it's it's newer. Uh, and a lot of social enterprises, I think there are social enterprises that are being developed uh, or, or, or set up. They're specifically focusing on that, like how wood is sourced, for example, in countries where there's a lot of depletion, and thinking about how to do that in a more sustainable way. Um, so I think over the last, I would say, five years, that's you know really. And the expectations, expectations are changing, and it's becoming part of the conversation. Um, I think it has to be realistic in a way when you think about what the priorities are. You know, um, you know, a successful business has to be aware of those things in order to be able to, you know, operate over time. But uh, you know, putting it in a kind of a, a line of what needs to be done. Sometimes we get a little bit ahead of ourselves in terms of saying, you know, well, we can't do business with this company because they don't have these environmental standards in place, you know, is that necessarily realistic based on what their operations are? But it's definitely part of the conversation. Um, and we include it in our training. Thank you. I'd love if you could just do a little um, bio, like a little review of your journey, mm -hmm. just you know, for these guys cracking their own journeys. Yeah. How did you get to be here in this position? Um, <laughs> it's never linear. Yeah. And we ask everybody some point. We, we generally hear this an answer to this question, and it's always really interesting those flashpoints in your yeah. career that take you in a direction you know you didn't expect. You know, I started in I started in direct service. I was working with my first job and it was because I was very involved with uh, the organization when I was in high school. I graduated college and I came back and I was helping to manage a Ronald McDonald house, which uh, supports critically and terminally ill children. And so I always want, I, you know, that's kind of always where my heart was, was in direct service. And I went on from there to work with adolescents, and uh, that was domestic, but then I started looking at, I got involved with a foundation that was focused on how adolescents are affected by armed conflict. Um, and that was really a turning point for me. Out to Kosovo and not long after the war, and worked with the Serbian and Roma and Albanian youth, and was just floored by you know what I observed and saw. It was just extraordinary, and I think at that point I, I loved I loved the, the, the direct service meeting. You know, just being able to work directly with someone is so inspiring. The change that you see, uh, the work that's involved in that, uh, but. When I started to kind of understand what some of the bigger problems were, you know, not just isolated to these, you know, smaller relationships that I had, I got very interested in what the drivers were, what was happening in a lot of these these countries when I was in the you know, when I moved into the international development space, um, and you know, the drivers of a lot of the conflict was was unemployment and a lack of economic development and opportunity and business development, and that just really Really resonated with me. It made so much sense, um, and that's you know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pro, my, my brain works the way that I just want to solve problems. You know I just make order out of chaos, and and then I went off to Afghanistan and met these entrepreneurs and saw the the problems that they were facing and how again how resourceful and driven they were and how well they were doing in spite of of the support that they were getting from the international community. God, if we can accelerate the emergence and nurture the emergency of these entrepreneurs, I think what can happen. And I just thought, if there is any way I can contribute to this, I am. I'm in. I'm in. You know, I was just, I was just in it at that moment. And you know, the more entrepreneurs that I meet, and the more I see what's happening in a lot of the marketing markets, um, the more evidence I get that you know it makes sense. You know, we're doing the right thing here. Uh, yeah, and so that's that's. It was a bit linear, actually. Yeah, it was. Oh, no, that blows that theory. No, that's good. People are linear. People are very comfortable with linear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, A led to B, B led to C. D, and here I am. It wasn't 
wasn't that easy. You know, I to say that at all. You know, I might have, there's a lot of crazy moments and everything. Yeah, of course. But it did, yeah, it, it, I got very lucky to get it away. Um, very, very lucky to get exposed to some things mm -hmm. that were very transformative for me personally and opened my eyes, got me to think, you know, probably back into graduate school where I had some time to really consider it and go back, go out and just try it. Um, and, you know, you, you have ideas about the way things work that completely get destroyed in the process, right? <laughs> um, and you realize how foolish you are and naive you are. But um, a lot of that was really getting the opportunity to go out and, and, and work on the ground and, and see the way things were really happening. And uh, a lot of that just reinforced what that aha moment was um, in terms of my own commitment to, you know, changing these kinds of, uh, you know, contributing in some way equaling the playing field and equaling access to opportunity for all and, and reducing poverty. It's completely possible. You know, it's doable. Um, there's a lot of work to 